Milkweed, Chapter 7. Good morning. Those were the good times. Our icebox, our cellar shelves were full of food. We ate peaches and brandy and peanut butter and caviar sandwiches. We ate apples and lemon danish and cheese puffs and hickory smoked trout. We ate candy all day long. My favorite was a buttercream with a hazelnut inside. There was usually only one to a candy box, and often not even that, and I was not good at telling them on sight. So, I broke open chocolates by the hundreds, searching for my prize. I raced through candy shops, tossing boxes into a sack, and raced out to the usual chorus of, Stop, thief! At home, I frantically dug for hazelnut buttercreams, flinging the rest aside. Yuri scolded me for wasting. Except for the candy, he made me finish eating everything I started. As for Yuri, he loved pickles. Big, fat, juicy pickles. They floated in barrels of brine in grocery stores. The urge would strike him suddenly and he'd pop up. Let's go. Pickle run. We went on many pickle runs because Yuri would not eat. Yuri would only eat fresh pickles. If a pickle had been out of the brine more than a day, poof, he stuck his nose up at it. This meant we had to keep finding new stores. No one ever saw him take anything, but after a while, a grocer would begin to notice that whenever a certain red-haired boy came into the store, pickles disappeared. And on the way to a pickle place, I was not allowed to snatch anything. Yuri did not want his pickle run spoiled by a snatch and grab of mine. But on the way back, as he contentedly ate his prize, I was allowed to do as I wished. Yuri usually took things from store shelves and counters. Except for candy, I took from people. We'd be strolling along, pickle juice from Yuri's chin spattering the sidewalk when I would see something and take it. Off I went, weaving through crowds of people, while Yuri munched away, pretending he didn't know me. Back home, he would say, How did you do that? And I would shrug. I just do it. You're amazing, he would say. And I would feel like a buttercream with a hazelnut heart. Sometimes Yuri went out alone, and sometimes he didn't. Scouting is what he called it when he went out alone, and he told me to stay put. One time I did not stay put. It was not long after the jackboots came, and I got into my head to go to the Grand Boulevard and see the parade again. That's what I believed, that the parade was never ending. It went on day and night, and I was missing it. I climbed out of the cellar, and I started running. But when I came to the Grand Boulevard, there was no parade. There were streetcars and automobiles and people upon people, but no parade. I saw two jackboots walking, and I ran up to them. Where is the parade? The tall one laughed. You're five days late. It's over. I tried to understand. Are the tanks gone? Not gone. Yuri says that you hate me. I told them. But I don't believe him. Good. I want to be a jackboot someday. The tall one said something to the other, but I could not understand the words. He reached down and ran his fingers through my short hair. Someday, dark little boy. Are you a Jew? No. I'm a gypsy. Are you a Jew? Again he smiled and said something to the other who did not smile. Let's hope not he said, and they walked on. I saw a lady carrying cream puffs. Don't ask me how I knew they were cream puffs. It was a white pastry box like any other, wrapped in white string. I just had a sense about those things. Maybe it came from snatching food for as long as I could remember. I was coming up behind her, and she wore a red coat, as the air was chilly. The seams of her stockings were perfect black lines running from her heels to the hem of the coat. Her blonde hair spilled from a little black hat. The pastry box dangled from one hand. She was not a screamer. Not everybody was. And after I snatched the box, I heard no screams behind me. No footsteps either. She was not a chaser. Still, I ran. I always ran. I did not know how not to run. That was my life. I snatched. I ran. I ate. So I was running, chased by myself, you might say. And I turned a corner, and I was suddenly flat on my back. I had run into someone, a boy, a boy with one arm. 
Gypsy, he cried. My cream puffs. They were scattered about the sidewalk. So were his cherry turnovers. He reached for a cream puff and he threw it at my face. I threw one at him. We laughed and scooped up vanilla cream puff filling from our cheeks and we ate it. We scooped vanilla filling and cherry goop from the sidewalk. And what we didn't eat, we flung at each other. And in between, we fell onto our backs and we laughed. Walkers veered into the street to avoid us. Well, well, came a voice. Little thieves. It was a jackboot. He was grinning down at us and we were gone fast as flies. Ooh, nice simile. One arm went one way, me the other. And the jackboot's, jackboot's laughter was fading. I ran down alleyways. I didn't recognize where I was. But it didn't matter. I was in the city. It was the only world I knew. I came to a garden. And some people had little gardens in their backyards. The gardens were all brown stalks and stubble and fallen leaves by now. As it was October. And so was this one. Except for one viney little upshoot of green and red. It was a tomato plant. Probably the last surviving one of the season. I knew something of seasons, but nothing of months and years. I had no use for them. I know now that it must have happened in the month of October, in the year 1939. Many green tomatoes dangled from the vine, and two plump, ripe red ones. I was still hungry. I pulled off a red tomato, I sat myself down cross-legged on the ground, and I ate it. The juice spilled down my chin as pickle juice often did on Yuri's. I picked off the other tomato, and as I was eating it, I turned my eyes toward the back of the house. Someone was sitting on the step. It was a little girl. She was watching me. I never ate with someone watching me unless it was Yuri or one of the boys, and eating came after running. And yet, I didn't move. I sat there and ate the last red tomato in the city of Warsaw, and I watched her watching me. Her elbows were on her knees, and her face leaned into her cupped hands. Her hair was curly and the color of bread crust. Her eyes were brown as chestnuts. Her eyes were very big. And when I finished eating the tomato, I stood and I walked off. I didn't run. And when I looked back, She was still watching me. Her round, big, unblinking eyes made me feel as if I had just become visible. As if I had never been seen before. And when I was far from the backyard, I kept looking back. When I told Yuri I found two red tomatoes and ate them, he didn't believe me. On the first day that the lights went out, Yuri said to me, <coughs> Okay, this is who you are. Your name is Misha Pilzudski. And he told me the rest. I, Misha Pilzudski, was born a gypsy somewhere in the land of Russia. My family, including two great-grandfathers and a great-great-grandmother, who was 109 years old, traveled from place to place in seven wagons pulled by 14 horses. There were 19 more horses trailing the wagons, as my father was a horse trader. My mother told fortunes with cards, and she could look at cards and tell you how you were going to die. She could look into your eyes and tell you the name of the person you would marry. Every night the wagon stopped in a grove of trees by a stream, and the chorus of us little children, the chores of us little children were to gather sticks for the fire and to feed the horses. My favorite horse was a speckled mare called Greta. And every night, one of my brothers hoisted me onto Greta's back, and I pretended to ride. I had seven brothers and five sisters. I was not the youngest, but I was the smallest. I was so small because I was once cursed by another gypsy who did not like the fortune my mother gave him. And since we were gypsies, we belonged everywhere. That's how we came to the land of Poland. My father traded many horses. My mother told many fortunes. And then we were bombed by a jackboot airplane. The war had not yet started, and jackboot airplanes were simply flying about, practicing for the war, using the gypsies as targets. 
the jackboot general told the pilots that they could practice on Jews and gypsies. And so when a jackboot pilot saw our seven wagons full of gypsies, he immediately dropped his bombs on us, plus his goggles and everything else in his pockets. Fortunately, we looked up and we saw everything coming down, and we scattered seven wagons in seven directions. I was with my mother and father. They were sad, but I was not, because Greta, my favorite horse, was with us. And then one night, as we were camped in a grove of trees, some Polish farmers who hated gypsies even more than jackboots hated Jews, came with torches and tied up my mother and father, and they stole me and Greta. And for a long time, Greta and I were slaves to the farmers. They fed us nothing but turnips and made us drink pig's milk. And then one night, Greta broke out of her stall and ran away. And the next day, I ran away too. And I searched and searched for Greta and my family all over Poland. And finally, I came to the city of Warsaw, where I learned to steal food to keep from starving. I never saw Greta or my parents or my brothers and sisters again. And so, thanks to Yuri, in a cellar beneath a barbershop somewhere in Warsaw, Poland, in the autumn fall of the year 1939, I was born, you might say, with one detail missing. I waggled my yellow stone in Yuri's face. What about this? He stared. Yeah, that was your father's. He gave it to you. What else? Before you were kidnapped? That's it. That's all there is. I loved my story, and no sooner did I hear the words than I became my story. I loved myself, and for days afterwards, I did little else but stare into the barbershop mirror, fascinated by the face that stared back. Misha Pilzutski, I kept saying. Misha Pilzutski. Misha Pilzutski. I loved my name. And then it was no longer enough to stare at myself and repeat my name to myself. I needed to tell somebody else. That's the end of chapter 7.